Ben， 你好吗？哎，我挺好的。你好，你好，你好，小马，你好。哎，我也要很高兴，因为我关注你的故事很久了，就是自从好几年前，我看你你之前的上过很多各种，也包括美国、中国媒体采访，故事特别有有趣。我也今天啊、呃、特别高兴，呃，和你一起做采访，因为我关注你的视频，然后看你的视频已经。很多年了，你你在美国，我在澳大利亚，两个国家特别远，但是有机会通过视频可以一起聊天。你现在在在澳大利亚吗？我现在呢，在全世界最宜居的城市，我的老叫墨尔本啊。然后我是土生土长的墨尔本人，从小在墨尔本长大啊。So I want to uh come and get down here and talk about the thing that you originally. Got you famous a few years ago. You you got into a car accident and you woke up in the hospital speaking fluent Chinese. I was involved in a really serious car accident. So a truck drove into the side of the car that I was in.、Uh, I was you know, went through a lot of trauma. I was in a, a coma for about a week, and no one really knew what was going to happen when I woke up. And so, you know, the doctors couldn't really explain what was going to happen. They didn't know, you know, when I woke up if I could still speak or if I could function or if anything. You know, they just didn't know what was happening, and all the scans and stuff didn't couldn't really give a, a concrete conclusion about you know, what's really going to happen. After about a week, when I woke up, the first words that came out of my mouth were Mandarin. And so, at the time, there was a Chinese nurse there, and、um, of course, you know, I was speaking, which is fantastic. But、um, obviously, I don't really look Chinese, and so the nurse would speak to me in Chinese and see what's going on and. At that time, like I had no idea really what I was what I was speaking, and so it was just the most natural language which came out. And so now, reflecting back on you know the experience ten years ago, what happened was that my internal monologue, the voice which is speaking, that was in Mandarin. So when I'd see an apple, I wouldn't see an apple; I'd see pingu. Or when I was thinking about how I should you know communicate, the most natural thing to come out was Chinese. So it didn't matter whether I was speaking with my parents, which don't speak a word of Chinese. Or whether I was speaking with a doctor, it was just that was the most natural language to come out. Did it initially affect your abilities in English? Absolutely, and that was the scariest thing for my parents. Was of course they're happy as heck that their son's woken up and speaking Chinese, but <laughs> but he's、Chinese. not speaking English. He's a different person. No, no English at all. So the first couple of days it was only Chinese, and so my parents,、wow. of course, they're happy that I'm making, you know, I'm conversation, but. It's obviously they're speaking English and I'm speaking back in Chinese, so I was able to understand the English, but I wasn't able to consciously realize that I'm speaking Chinese, and it was just Chinese coming out. So they were thinking, oh, maybe I need to learn Chinese. And then after a couple of days, though, I started mixing the two languages together, and that's when they got really worried because no one could understand because it was just it was a it was almost my brain trying to work out you know these two languages and you know how to put them together. And then it was only really I think after a week or so that. I was able to really, you know, English for one person and Chinese for the other. Wow! To be clear, this wasn't as though you woke up in the hospital、uh, speaking a language that you had never encountered before. You had studied Chinese、Correct. in school prior to this.、Um, Correct. And I think that's sometimes missed、uh, in the news reports、right. is that I it wasn't like I had hadn't had any association to the language at all. I had studied at high school.、Yeah. You know, I, I spent some time in China, in Beijing, studying and traveling around. But post the car accident, what happened was that my fluency was almost、um, pushed forward or fast paced because what happened was that、uh, I really internalized the language and my internal monologue became Chinese, and so everything in my head was going、yeah. on in Chinese. And so from that stage, it's almost like, you know, I. I, I had a leap in that language journey, and very quickly I was able to internalize quite a lot of the language. And just by default, you know, the natural way that I was thinking, whether I was dreaming, whether I was awake, whether I was speaking to parents or whoever, I was first thinking in Chinese rather than my you know, mother tongue, English. Now, I, I do think that some people are going to be,、um, you know, understandably skeptical. Of your story, and and to be honest, I was actually skeptical of it for a while as well. But when you do a, a little bit of research here into previous cases, th- th- this is actually a documented phenomenon called foreign accent syndrome, where your accent is actually affected by by head trauma.、Um, and there are also rare cases, but documented cases, 
where your linguistic abilities themselves are affected, right? So for example, in 2006, a British woman was interviewed in The Guardian, having woken up from a coma speaking only French, despite having studied it only 30 years ago. American high school senior in 2016 woke up after a sports concussion speaking native level Spanish and had to relearn English. Former Manchester United footballer spoke fluent French after waking up from a sports-related uh, coma, even though he had only studied it in high school. And there's many more examples, right? Like Florida man wakes up speaking Swedish in 2013. Croatian teen wakes up speaking German in 2010. British man wakes up speaking Welsh in 2012. Czech man wakes up speaking perfect English in 2007. And actually, even the YouTuber Lindy Boats, who's a popular polygon on YouTube, woke up from anesthesia speaking Korean. And you can actually see her video on YouTube of that. With all of these incidents, none of these people ha had no experience with that and, and magically learned a language through a head trauma. This, this was all stuff they had studied before, but it seems like as you were describing it, kind of your internal monologue shifts and you're able to relate with that language internally and externally in a way very different from, from previously. What, what do you think that tells us about like what, how you learn languages and where, where this information is buried deep down. Before we get back to the video, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Raycon. You know that Raycon loves to sponsor my channel, and I'm okay with that personally, because I really love these earbuds as well. So with Raycons, whether you're looking for the everyday earbuds, which I have, low latency gaming headphones, speakers that are really great for parties or for work conferences, they've got you covered with all your audio needs. But for me personally, I have the everyday earbuds. I actually have two pairs of them. I really like them, and the main reason that I enjoy them is because they are very small, very convenient to take around, you just slip them right into your pocket. Most importantly, they have great sound and they cost half the price of what other premium audio brands cost. So my favorite things to use them for are for listening to podcasts or audiobooks. I like to listen to audio in different languages, but also for exercise, you know, because they're really great with making the shapes of these earbuds. So they stick in your ears very, very well and they don't fall out. The other great thing about these for exercise is that the controls are super intuitive. So if you're running and sweaty, all you gotta do Press one button, yeah, and then your music's going. Double click, next song. They come in a bunch of cool colors, so you get to pick and choose whichever color you prefer. So make sure to go to buyraycon.com slash shaumanyc for 15% off your first order. And I know you guys are gonna love them <laughs> because uh, I love them too. Without further ado, it's back to the video. There's, of course, there's lots of examples of this happening. From what the experience that I went through, it was, I think with languages, there's, there's, lots of different ways that you absorb and that you learn the language. And really the way that you get more and more fluent in it is through uh, repetitive uh, association. So the more times you hear something, the more time, you know, opportunities is it fit to kind of leave an impression on your brain. But uh, I think there's a lot of things that we don't know about the brain yet. And I've had a lot of different you know, medical experts make comments and kind of make analysis of what happened to me. I've had people say that, well, look, you know, People that speak English tend to, you know, you tend to be focused more, I think, on the left side of the brain where Broca's area is. But then Ch people that speak Chinese, they might go between the two sides of the brain a little bit more. And the fact that the trauma that I had was predominantly on the left side was maybe then the brain by default was like, okay, let's go to the side where there's less trauma and where maybe it's functioning a little bit better. And so naturally by that stage, then I kind of defaulted into that way of speaking. That's a very simplistic way of putting it. But I think what it shows us is that language, you know, we absorb lots of things and we're not always consciously aware of where all those things are. And for me was that it wasn't like suddenly I went from absolutely zero to hero. It was that my internal monologue became Chinese. And so particularly from that moment onwards, then my language learning journey just absolutely accelerated because it was so natural because everything that I was like, I was thinking about it 24 seven. And I think you know right. just as well as anyone, the best way to learn a language is to throw yourself into that environment and to force yourself to change new, new neural pathways, new ways of thinking that, and almost by definition, you know, fluency is when you don't need to think in your mother tongue first and then translate into your second language. It's where you right. jump start that route and you go straight to the language. And so for me, that's what was happening. I wasn't just thinking, and particularly for Chinese, because the way that a sentence works is, is very different, say, to English. So you kind of need to hear the whole, the whole sentence first before you can translate it properly. And so when you're speaking it, if you're not having to think first in English and then think, speak in Chinese, it, it accelerates it a lot. And that's what happened for me, at least, is that it just came out. It, didn't, it wasn't even like a conscious choice. It was, wouldn't matter yeah. if I'm listening to English or Chinese. It was just Chinese. And so from that moment <laughs> so onwards, crazy. it just... 
yeah, it was, it was, it just seemed the most natural thing. And I kid you not, I was dreaming, I was speaking. Now, of course, 10 years down the track, my internal monologue, when I'm speaking Chinese, I'm not thinking in English. It just comes out. But I think a lot of people, even if they've learned a language as their second language, they will say that too. You know, if they've lived in the country for a long time, they're not thinking in English and then speaking in Chinese. They're just, you know, Chinese is coming out. And that's what happened to me. One commonality I've read with some of the other incidents that I touched on of people suffering head trauma and then experiencing newfound uh, linguistic abilities is that um, a lot of them fade with time. So over time, you may acquire a sudden ability to speak Spanish or German or whatever, but you lose it over time. Did, did, did anything like that happen with you? So for me, I think the fact that post the accident, it was not only that my language ability, you know, was, you know, accelerated, it was also for me, it was almost like a defining moment. Like I didn't die. Like this is my purpose. <laughs> like, you know, right. this is really what I want to do. Yeah. And so I took one unit of Chinese at Melbourne uni where I was studying at the time. And so I did that. And then uh, I went over to China and did a competition called Han Yu Tiao, which is where you've got like a hundred or so uh, participants from around the world, you know, from all sorts of countries, you know, Japan, Germany, South Africa, all over the place but our common language and common interest is Chinese. And at that stage, this was only two or three months after I'd actually been on the accident. I went over and participated in this competition. And for me, it was a real defining moment going, wow, like this is amazing. Our common language is Chinese, not English. And I'm making all these friends from the one around the world, uh, finding you know, commonalities and differences. And that really like was quite a defining moment for me was that, well, uh, whatever I'm going to be doing, I know it's going to involve Chinese and China because I may, you know, it's a, like a purpose in a way. Yeah. And from that moment onwards, a lot of my friends were Chinese. Uh, I founded like a travel company, which was Mandarin walking tours of Melbourne. And so that was, I was speaking Chinese in that sense all the time. And then I went for an exchange back over to China. So from that moment onwards, I was always speaking Chinese in my day-to-day -day life, I was writing it, I was involved in programs. And so I didn't really get that chance, I guess, maybe to lose it or for it to kind of become less natural. Without a doubt, my internal monologue, I was able, to, it went back to English because I was speaking English more than Chinese. But then when I went over to China and lived over there, when I was speaking more Chinese than English, like it kind of went back to Chinese. So it became a lot more fluid between the two. But I can imagine if you're speaking a language and then you don't have an opportunity to practice it, it's like anything, you lose muscle. Maybe it's always there underneath it if you can go find it again, but once you lose muscle, you kind of got to build it back. So I guess in some sense, you know, as horrible as this accident was, um, it did somewhat mark a, um, a turning point in your life where uh, it propelled you actually to, um, to appear on not just one or two, but three um, extremely popular national Chinese TV shows, Han Yu Chao, which is the, the Chinese competition for foreigners that you just mentioned. Then Fei Chang Wu Rao, right? If you were the one, which is a dating show where you, like you compete for the hand of one beautiful woman. And then Fei Zheng Shi Hui Tan, which is a show called Informal Talks, which is like a talk show, different foreign representatives from other countries, all speaking in of course, Chinese. How did that all come about? I mean, like, especially right after this accident, all of a sudden you're going to China and appearing on all these TV shows. Like, what happened there? So post the accident, uh, I, I was really tired, like a lot of people after, you know, been through a coma, I, I'd broken off, I'd fractured a lot of bones in my body. And so uh, yeah. I'd gone through rehab for about a month. And then after that, I was really uh, – I couldn't sit still. Like, I was – it was quite an experience where – you know, I, I very came very close near to death that I felt like I got to do something with myself. I got to do something with my life. And Chinese was this thing. And so I only had the energy to do one, you know, real one subject at university. So I did Mandarin. And so I did the most advanced level of Mandarin I could do at university. And then uh, that went pretty well. And one of the professors or the teachers there uh, nominated me and said, hey, we've got this, this competition called Han Yu Chao and you can go to it and basically, you know, you do poems, you sing songs, uh, you, you get quizzed on your Chinese knowledge. How about you give this a go? And I thought, well, 
my Chinese is pretty good at the moment, so I may as well give it a go. And then I got through the Victorian finals and the Australian finals and then ended up representing Australia in the, in the world finals. And at that moment, like I mentioned, this is like an iron person contest. There's so many different aspects and it's all on TV and standing on stage with all these other representatives. Like it was a really exciting time and I was very passionate about Chinese at that stage too. And so I was like, you know what, this is really meaningful. Maybe this is a meaning and I should keep continuing this, this language and this love, for this, the culture and history and just learn more and more and more. And then once I'd done that show and did quite well in the show and was over in China for about a month during this competition, I came back to Australia and then someone found me to host uh, another a Chinese like talk show in Melbourne that was in Mandarin and we talk about things that are relevant, I guess, to Chinese in Australia. And so I did that show and then that led on to another and then the opportunity to come up for uh, a Fijian Wura, which is like a Chinese date show, which is one Chinese bachelor and 24 girls. They ask all sorts of questions. They'll, you know, they'll be like, you know, what car do you drive? What's your profession? Or when do you want to get married? When do you want kids? And all, you know, the craziest questions you can think of. I was bombarded with questions for an hour. Like abs and this is, this is a brutal show. If you see some of the things that they ask, I was quite lucky. I think I got a good cut and the girls went easy on me, but some people weren't as lucky. <laughs> like, it was really scary. I, I can tell you that. Like when, I don't know if, for those that have seen the show, you got to come down on this little stairway thing. Can you feel yeah. it? And then they're like, yeah, by the way, there's 50 million people watching this episode today. You're like, oh, that, that's two Australia's populations. 50 million people watching that show. Maybe, maybe more, supposedly more. Wow. But, um, Look, overall, it was a lot of fun. It was a big challenge. And I think that's kind of how I saw it too. At the time I was single and I was, you know, I thought, wow, if I can meet the one on this show, fantastic, which I got someone, but you know, we just weren't suitable for each other, which unfortunately that's what happens, mm. some can happen in life with relationships. But it, it was almost like if I can survive this show, then, you know, that's a testament to my language and my Chinese and my, uh, you know, taking the challenge and so for me, it was not only just an opportunity to maybe find someone, but also to, well, let's give this a, a challenge a go. If there were 50 million, over 50 million people watching this show, presumably many of them women, did you get any DMs or uh, email messages <laughs> after the, the show, airing? So that, <laughs> it's really funny. What they say is on the show, if you get someone on the show, so you match with someone on the show, which I did, you get, you get more people sending messages than if you don't. <laughs> and so they give you this email address and um and it gets completely filled with people but then they're not just people saying oh hi you know if, if it doesn't work out date me it's also people saying oh you know i like china or like oh you know when i come to melbourne i want to go on that walking tour so <laughs> of course when there's a lot of people watching a lot of people send these emails after the show and they do they right. put it up at the end of the show with your uh with the email that you can wow. send to oh oh my god that must have been an experience, huh? Yeah. And then after the day show, then there was another one in between called uh, Viva La Romance, or, um, uh, which is another sort of show where they have famous celebrity wives that are movie stars and stuff, and they go over and travel to a country, and, and then their husbands sit and watch the show, and they comment on it. And it sounds a bit crazy, but anyway, I was their Australian tour guide, so I took around a couple of these stars. And then after that, then came the opportunity to go on informal talks, which was the most recent one. And so it's almost like momentum. It's a bit like anything, YouTube yeah. channels. Uh, you, you do one thing and it leads to another opportunity and it leads to another thing. And if you're really passionate and involved in that process, like it just keeps growing. And so, that, and then the most recent one is that informal talk and that's where I am now. Informal talks, you've got 10 representatives from around the world. We sit around a table and we just debate and talk about topics which are relevant generally to Chinese youth. But it's really fascinating because you'll have someone from say Japan and Australia and you know Iran and, and South Africa, but our commonality is Chinese language and love for Chinese culture. But yeah. the way that we see things is very different. And so you get a lot of bandy, you have like kind of challenges that you'll do against each other. And we filmed one of the seasons in January, 2020. Yeah. So January 2020 is when COVID started. And so I was in China, in Beijing, filming in December and January. And, and then I 
flew back to us. We, we were in, uh, and this is with Hubei Wish, which is basically Wuhan TV. And so we had mm. a team of 60 people from yeah. Wuhan filming the show in Beijing. And then I filmed, I think it was pretty much most of this season, then flew back to Australia and was going to go back over in February to film the rest of the season. But Wuhan went into lockdown and then we delayed it for a little bit. Then Beijing went into lockdown and China went into lockdown and then Australia and the whole world went into lockdown. So uh, I'm still on the show, but I'm not in China. So the, right. uh, I'm not really not necessarily one of the, the people that are on every episode anymore because I just can't, I couldn't have got to China for about two or so years. What was your overall experience like as a foreigner on Chinese TV? So there is so much opportunity in China with programs. Like there's 1.4 billion people there, 20% of the world's population. Yeah. There's a lot of TV shows and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, of finance for TV shows to do really big style TV shows. My experience has always been really, really good. And a lot of the ones that I've been involved in, it's, there's always been a cultural dialogue. Like my specialty is that I'm Australian. I've grown up in Australia. And so uh, I naturally have uh, an Australian way of seeing things as with, you know, you would have an American way or, or someone from Canada or wherever they would see things through the lens of the place where they've grown up. But having spent a lot of time in China and having a lot of Chinese friends and business partners, uh, there's that touch as well. So every show I've had a really good time. I've been treated really well. There's, it's been challenging though, like long hours. Uh, it's, there's big, you know, there's, there's lots of different challenges, of course. But I think that's probably just challenges of the media industry, not necessarily of, of China. I think... Right. If if you're in filming stuff, you know it's it's your Saturday night at eight thirty p.m. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just there's challenges and there's right. a lot of time requirement for it as well. So, but overall, it, it's been exceptional. And the the friends that I've made through language and through Chinese uh, have been friends for life, and people that I would definitely not know if I didn't have this connection with China and this language. My main job is a property developer, so I'm very passionate about property. So there's always some sort of spin on property here and there. So this is and, like um, a side gig. <laughs> yeah, no, so the, yeah the, the, I would love to go full time with um, the social media stuff, right. but the property is my, my main sort of job. But I've just launched a podcast too with my brother, and that's about property too, called Property Pals. And we're hoping to start doing it in Chinese as well. How did you get so good at Chinese because you're obviously very good at this enough to go on many Chinese TV shows. So naturally my story is a little bit different from the average person learning language because I, right. I had a bit of a speed bump, which was almost like a, a weird a boost. In the middle of it. <laughs> but I think my understanding of learning language is still the same as other people because after that it wasn't like, I still have learned a lot and in, in you know, since then, because there's, there was lots of words that I still didn't know, even though my feeling for the language was very strong. And so from that experience and the time living and, and speaking Chinese and, and continuing to learn Chinese, the most important thing that I find about Chinese, it, this is probably the same as any language, but particularly important for someone who is coming from a non-Asian language or from a, say, like an English background, learning Chinese, the most difficult part of it isn't the tones, it isn't the characters, it's the concepts and the ability to internalize the language and when you're speaking, not to be thinking in English because, say, for example, and I see this in a lot of books about languages, sometimes they say, um, how are you doing today in English? How do you say that in Chinese? Mm. Well, the way you say it in Chinese is not how you doing today, which is kind of actually an Australian way of saying it anyway, but, you know, so what you should try and push yourself to do when you're learning a language is to to speak in Chinglish in your head you know mm -hmm. you today how are you going or you today how uh, and that's just an example and then slowly if you push yourself to do it that way your grammar will improve and your your thinking of the concepts will improve and then on top of that like less is more and I'm not sure I'm sure this is probably a lot of people have said this too as well Shama but like you don't want to try and do 100 words in a day. You don't even want to try and do 10 or 20 or 30, but do a couple depending on your, uh, how much time you have to do it, but do them really well. And this is incredibly important for Chinese because, you know, rather than thinking, oh, I did mum and I did, you know, learnt the word for mum and it's ma, which is not right. 
like in Chinese, you've got tones, ma, 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 all mean completely different things. So with Chinese, learn one thing, learn it really well, you know, know exactly how to write the character, know the tone, know what it looks like. Once you get a bit more advanced, know some examples of how you put it in different sentences and then, you know, get to the point of where you're, you're so strong in it that you can teach someone else how to say it or how to, how to use the word. And I think, you know, it's a lot more powerful when you're speaking languages if you have 100 words that you can use really, really well than 1,000 words that, you, you know, you can use very so-so and not very well. And then the third point is, uh, is just don't be scared. I think with languages, naturally, you're going to make mistakes and don't be put off when you try and speak the language and someone speaks back to you saying English. Just, you know, you're going to kind of take it with a bit of a laugh and uh, be able to just know that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to say silly things like, you know, you're going to call your mum a horse rather than mum, you know, mama and this kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, really try and just do less, you know, focus on the small things. Just try it every single opportunity you get. I know you've done this throughout your life is that just use in any situation you can. Go to a Chinese restaurant and just try and yeah. use it. You'll always find people that are so happy to speak with you in it. And the beauty about Chinese is that it really, like, there's an opportunity to speak Chinese everywhere in the world. Uh, and with other languages, it can be a bit more difficult if there are less people that speak it. But particularly for the big languages, you know, Chinese, Spanish, English, these sort of languages, there's always opportunities if you seek them. And try and focus on things that you are passionate about. Like I've got a really good vocabulary of property and really good vocabulary of you know, certain different things in Chinese. But if you ask me to talk about, um, you know, biology in Chinese, yeah my, even my english ability in biology isn't very strong so but for right. someone who likes science that might be a way for them to to be able to learn it quite quickly because they're passionate about it they understand it so it's really easy to create those neural pathways and internalize that language so what's that so to summarize uh less is more focus on your, what you're passionate about don't be afraid to make mistakes and then really try and internalize the the grammar and the concepts of how things work. And hopefully that will help you accelerate your language learning journey. Dude, that's, that's such a crazy experience that you've had on TV. And you're doing this all while having a full-time job. But I think like the, the, it's, it's a bit like anything. If you're really passionate about something, it <clears> doesn't really seem like work to me. Like, uh, and what's the beauty is I know for you, of course, there's times every day um, that you know, there, there's admin and stuff that you don't like, but there's a fundamental passion under, underneath everything. And, you know, what you're doing, I'm sure, you know, it's bringing joy and happiness for a lot of different people and sharing stories and sharing something you're passionate about. And I think if, you know, if I can influence some people and encourage some people to learn a language or to embrace another culture, like it's just, it unlocks so many opportunities and doors and friendships and whatever you want to do. Like I always encourage people with Chinese, learning Chinese, uh, it's going to unlock so many opportunities going forward just fundamentally that there's so many people in the world that speak Chinese and China is such a big country, but uh, it's really unique to be able to speak more than one language and connect with more than one culture. I think people watching this, this interview and watching your experiences can tell the value of learning a language to fluency that it can have in your life. I mean, your experiences are, are definitely extremely interesting and have definitely given you like a very rich set of knowledge and experiences that we would not have had had you never learned Chinese. So, um, and, and in my case, for sure, that's just your story can, can inspire a lot of people who, you know, want to learn Chinese or really any other, any other language and, uh, can really open you all up to all these amazing experiences. Yeah. I hope so. And it's so easy now too. like, look at us, we're across the world and, even yeah. 10 years ago, I know we had Skype and stuff, but it wasn't this easy. Like it just wasn't as easy yeah. as it is now to maintain yeah. friendships and, and and even like you could easily get a Chinese teacher or whatever teacher who's based in overseas, but you know, you're know you based in your own country and then you just video them for half an hour a day. Um, exactly. And you, can, and you can watch videos on your phone and stuff. It's just so accessible now. It's just I guess yeah. you've got to really start with a point of passion. Um, and sometimes that yeah. requires a little bit of push and it can be a bit difficult, but yeah, no, nah, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of, um, opportunities that kind of can come from that. Make sure you guys go check out Ben Xiaoming at Red Rooster Ben. Ho 
Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. I like Red Rooster. <laughs> a little bit of plug for Red Rooster at <laughs> at Red Rooster. YouTube, so you, YouTube, Red and, Ruben, right? and all all the kind of Western medias is Red Roo, R E D R O O. So Roo is like a kangaroo. That's what I thought. Yeah. Love China. I'm Australian. Red Roo Ben. And if you're on my Chinese <laughs> socials like Weibo, Billy Billy, it's Hong Dai Shu Xiaoming, which is the same thing but in Chinese. So look. Once again, you know, Selma, thank you very much for the interview. I think, you know, it, it is it is a bit of an honor to speak with you too because I've been watching your videos for quite a while and I, I've always really loved the right, right. ones, particularly where, 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 where you <laughs> start speaking Chinese, you know, in a situation. Because yeah. I, I kind of can relate that a little bit too. Sometimes if someone's speaking Chinese and they're talking about me and then, like, I can hear what they're saying and then suddenly you just burst out <laughs> speaking Chinese to them and they go, hey, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Wish you all the best. Wish you happy year uh, of the uh, year of the rabbit. And I hope all your dreams come true. Good year, 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 good year